Well, um, it took her a while, but Dorothy Butler Gilliam, after a pioneering journalism career uh, that spanned more than half a century, has finally told her life story. Uh, and we're absolutely delighted to have her here with us this evening to talk about it. Uh, the title of her memoir, Trailblazer, captures Dorothy's uh, groundbreaking contributions to journalism, not only as the first black woman reporter to be hired by the Washington Post, but also in later years as an editor, columnist, and industry leader. As Don Graham says in a blurb for the book, no one made greater efforts to share her success with others, to teach school-age journalists to open the ranks of newspaper management to minorities. In Trailblazer, Dorothy reflects on her upbreak, upbringing in the Jim Crow South, her growing awakening to her own potential, the challenges of being a journalist in socially segregated Washington, her marriage uh, to the painter Sam Gilliam, and her ongoing efforts to bring people of color into mainstream journalism. She first came to the Washington Post in 1961 uh, at age 23 with a graduate degree in journalism from Columbia. It was a time when taxis in DC wouldn't stop for her because of her color. And when going to a high society home for an interview, she was directed around back to the servant's entrance. But through it all, Dorothy persevered, pressing not only to make her own mark as a prominent reporter in the civil rights era, but eventually to help train a new generation of minority journalists. For a time, Dorothy served as an editor in the style section, helping under Ben Bradley to remake that part of the paper. Then in 1979, she began writing what became a popular column for the Post, uh, covering education, uh, politics, and race, the column ran regularly in the Metro section for 19 years. When Dorothy left the Post in 2003, she already had been working on a separate track aimed at achieving greater diversity in journalism. She had co-founded an institute toward that end, now known as the Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. Dorothy still serves on the Institute's board. In these times when racism tragically remains all too prevalent, Dorothy's long history, both as a vanguard journalist and as a champion for mentoring other journalists of color, stands as a truly inspiring example, an example of what determination, commitment, and caring, for, uh, caring about one's own community can achieve. As an added treat, Dorothy is going to be in conversation here with DC's very own Kojo Namdi host for 20 years of WAMU's daily, The Kojo Nambi Show, and on Fridays, The Politics Hour. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming both Dorothy and Kojo. Well, good evening. good evening, and welcome. Where should I start with Dorothy Gilliam? With Dorothy Butler Gilliam, I think I'll start at Columbia University. When you were in the School of Journalism, and a professor there told you essentially that you have so many things going against you that you're probably going to make it. <laughs> what did you understand him to mean by that? I understood him to mean that uh, I would be diving into a sea of white men. I would be carrying a, an individual, uh, an invisible weight called race, another invisible race. Uh, weight called gender, and uh, I wasn't sure I knew how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> but it certainly did not stop you. What do you feel was the source of your determination? That's a good question. And um, I am from the 
south. And I was a uh, daughter of a minister. And uh, I think in many ways, uh, part of my inner strength came from that kind of experience. Uh, growing, growing up in uh, uh, a time when I think the black community was just very loving, very caring. Uh, we were taught not to hate, uh, no matter what other people said to us or what, did, what they did to us. I remember walking to school. We passed through this one white neighborhood and the kids would throw rocks at us. And so, but our teacher said, you know, don't throw rocks back. Don't throw rocks back. Because, you know, the, after a while, you know, when you act out on your hate, um, it comes back to you. And uh, so I think, you know, it was those kind of, you know, kind of simple teachings, but also that, that strong uh, strength uh, that's kind of hard to explain, you know, it's kind of a mysterious strength, but it's that strength that, that you come, with, that you get, you know, when you are in a, a, an atmosphere that segregated and poor, but uh, with this, this, this inner resource that you are somebody, no matter what other people may think of you. Well, even before this happened, while I think you were still a teenager in Louisville, Kentucky, you met a guy on a bus. Tell us about him or about that. Um, yeah, it was a, a man named Sam. <laughs> <laughs> And um, he was, um, even then, you know, very, very much a, an artist. And uh, Even though was, a student at the time, right? He was a student at the time at the University of Louisville. I was a student at Ursuline College. And uh, I was very interested in, once I knew I wanted to be a journalist, and I found that out, I was working at the local black newspaper as a secretary after school. And the... Um, I, all of a sudden, the editor of the paper said, we're going to send you out on a story. And I didn't know how to write a story, uh, but I, I took the dare. And, um, you know, once I did that and I saw how journalism just opened up new worlds to you, you know, things I would have never thought I would ever see, this field would open up to me. So uh, I wanted to go on and... and major in journalism. So uh, I left Sam behind. He was doing his thing. And then we finally got together again in uh, Washington um, in 1961. So you left that boyfriend, went on <laughs> to journalism school. How did you get the job at the Washington Post in 1961 when it had previously never had a female African-American reporter? Well, the Post routinely sent its city editor to uh, Columbia at the, uh, every year uh, just to you know, interview entering, interesting people and you know, potential uh, hires. And the um, city editor at that time was a man named Ben Gilbert. And he talked to me, but he wrote a letter back saying, we're interested in you, but you just don't have enough daily newspaper experience, which was true. Uh, but he also said, if you ever happen to be in Washington, you know, come by and meet our managing editor, who's a guy named Al Friendly. And I said, OK, well, I talked about how journalism was going to open new worlds. So I was going to Africa that summer. And uh, ironically, they were having their orientation here in Washington. So I called Mr. Gilbert and I said, I'm here. And he said, come meet the managing editor. And um, I think that it was just the, the fact that I was doing something different. Because he asked me, uh, uh, Al Friendly said, are you, um, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm getting ready to go to Africa. And there just weren't that many African Americans. We weren't called African Americans then either. Uh, going, going to Africa. And it was a program called Operations Crossroads, Operation Crossroads Africa. And uh, we went 
uh, and we did uh, we worked with uh, African students and we did some kind of physical labor. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Al Friendly said, well, um, why don't you write some stories for us? And there was so much to write. So I wrote some stories. But I am sure that they were not the world's greatest stories. Uh, I don't think they ever published them because there would not have been much need in Washington, you know. But um, I just think there was, he just saw some promise there. And um, I think that's how it, newspapers like people who have a little quirk, you know. <laughs> and, and they usually say, and the rest, they say, is history. But you were still so young. Did you have any sense of the historical weight that was being put on you to bear by being the first African-American female reporter at the Post? Not at all. <laughs> so, no, no. It, you, you had, I had no idea. But it did begin to dawn on you when you first started heading out for assignments. Um, you'd get an assignment. You also had, with that assignment, a deadline. So you had to get out. But even more importantly, you had to get back and file your story within a certain limited time period. How did that work out for you? Well, that was very hard because it was very hard to get taxi cabs in Washington if you were an African American. And uh, it was just very difficult. I would stand there and, you know, wave my hand and wave my hand. And occasionally a taxi would kind of slow down because I'd be standing at 15th and L. And, and then he'd see my face and he'd hit the accelerator. Um, so um, one of the things that, ha I, you know, I just had to, sometimes I'd walk and keep looking for a taxi. Uh, but one of the things that helped on the way back when I had to write the story I would uh, start using this Greg shorthand that I learned at Ursuline College. And I had, you know, we have a reporter's note. There are a lot of reporters in the room, but you remember those reporter notebooks that we had? So I would start writing the story in, in shorthand and, um, you know, spelling the names out, but the other things. And uh, so that when I got back, it gave me a little bit of a head start because it took me longer to go and longer to come back than it did everyone else. And in the introduction, it was also mentioned that there were occasions on which people in Washington, uh, being so unused to seeing a black woman working for the Washington Post, were taken a little aback. So you might as well tell that story of going to that very highfalutin apartment building here in Washington yeah, it was, in pursuit of a story. Yeah, and it was in northwest Washington, uh, west of the park, which is the, not a place where many black people lived at that time. Um, and uh, so when I got to the apartment house, this uh, woman was celebrating, I think it was like her 100th birthday. And that was a story, a big story, not a, you know, a feature story for the inside of uh, the metro or something. And uh, so I went uh, up, uh, I, you know, I thought I was dressed decently, you know, medium heels and a nice dress. And um, the, the doorman, it was a black doorman. And he said, uh, the maid's entrance is in the back. And uh, I was pretty icy with him. I was like, I'm not a maid. I am, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a maid, but I just wasn't one. And so I said, uh, you know, here's my post ID. And he looked at it, and then he took it inside to the doorman, and the doorman uh, made some phone calls upstairs, and I finally got in. Uh, but it was, it was, those kind of things can be a little depressing, you know, because they, they kind of happen with regularity. So part of it, you know, part of the challenge was also, you know, keeping upbeat and keeping... Um, uh, understanding at, at a later point that it was significant for me to succeed and to persevere because I just knew that it was going to be, if I didn't make it, uh, if I couldn't make it, it was going to be harder for the next black woman to be hired. And so I, I did see that as one of the extra challenges. And even though this was a story about a socialite, 
it was a story that appeared in the Metro section of the newspaper. Uh, well, this woman was not a socialite as much as it was just unusual. It didn't have a lot of hundred year olds uh, in 1961, you know. <laughs> I mean, now it's, it's pretty normal, but <laughs> yeah. But the reason I said that is because this was the kind of story you wanted to do because when you first went to the paper, you didn't want to be assigned the so-called, quote unquote, black stories. Why not? Well, first of all, I was kind of naive. Uh, but I, I didn't want to stereotype myself. So I was, you know, I want to write anything, everything. And um, so, you know, they were obliging me. But I looked up and, you know, the war on poverty. John Kennedy was in the White House. The war on poverty was, was starting. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a big interest in welfare. These stories were making page one. And, you know, my stories of birthday parties were making the metro, sometimes the inside of the metro. So uh, I really wanted to do something bigger and deeper. And uh, uh, I was really happy to. We had, the Post had a great welfare reporter at that time. Her name was Eve Edstrom. And, um, you know, she did the big stories. I was just glad to be, you know, writing some of those stories and uh, going out and really uh, uh, just sharing the, uh, the multitude of African-American stories. I don't think it hit me at first. At first, I wanted to, you know, to be an individual and, you know, not, not relate uh, racially uh, and... Uh, it was great to, you know, be able to just uh, uh, re really add depth, I think, to the paper. There was a great interest in the Post in those stories at that time. During that early period of the Post, what kind of support did you get from other female reporters at the Post? Well, uh, I think people were cordial in general. Um, other female reporters, there a lot. It was still a separate women's section. Uh, there was, there was, uh, the style section was not actually started until Bradley came, you know, several years later. So there was a section called Foreign About Women. And uh, I, I even admired, however, how those women managed to, you know, cover politics and, and you know, kind of uncover uh, uh, stories of interest, even though they were in a whole separate section of the paper. But... Um, I think, um, you know, I was more interested in, you know, people and, and really uh, figuring out uh, what policy was going to make a difference, what kind of change was going to make a difference. So uh, I, was, I was glad that I was on the city desk and then I was also able to, you know, stay on the city desk and get a few front page stories. What kind of advice and support were you, were you able to get from black male reporters at the Post? Well, there were two black male reporters there. And uh, one was a guy named Luther Jackson. And uh, one of the things that uh, he would always do is uh, go to lunch with me sometime because most of the white reporters, the restaurants were segregated, mostly. And most of the white reporters w didn't ask me to lunch. But uh, in answer to the previous question about women, uh, there was a white woman who kind of became a lunch buddy, in part because Ben Gilbert suggested it, you know, that would be a good thing to do. And so uh, since so many of the restaurants were segregated, there was a, uh, we, there was a place called Shoals Cafeteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that was one place well where we could... known in this room. <laughs> Uh, you all must remember the, the, the weekly specials and all of that. Uh, but that was one place that could where be we... a whole hour conversation. <laughs> one place where we do... Uh, when Luther and I could go to lunch and, and feel like we could be comfortable. And, uh, you know, we could share. But I didn't talk... There was not... Race was not discussed per se in the newsroom. And I certainly didn't come back to the editors and tell them about trouble catching taxi cabs and being mistaken for a maid and you know I, I i just knew i couldn't do that because you just wanted to get the job done i just didn't want to make it harder for the next person and i wanted to get the job done and i wanted to succeed myself 
And at some point along the way, you realize that what you characterized earlier as the naive view that you didn't want to cover black stories, that view changed. Mm -hmm. What caused it to change? Well, selfishly, I think it was because there were so many good stories um, <laughs> that, that, you know, the, the war on poverty, uh, uh, people who really were beginning to be concerned about welfare. You know, there were just a lot of good stories. One of the stories I was able to do was uh, I did a series on um, a Junior Village, a place where, you know, really young children were, were housed and kept for uh, uh, long periods. And um, so Jackie Kennedy decided that she wanted to come and check it out. And so, you know, sometimes it was nice when you, you know, you did a story that attracted the big wigs and they would come. And that was the kind of story that I did. But um, the, one of the reasons those stories were so important was because, you know, the, the uh, Mrs. Meyer was very interested in welfare as well. So, you know. So that made it a big deal. At some point along the way, um, the artist guy from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, ended up here? Yeah, we, we were married in <laughs> 1962 and uh, separated in 1982. So, Okay. The and we have three children. So, The book deals a great deal with your professional development and your view of Washington while being the only African-American female reporter at the Washington Post. You became increasingly conscious of the need for stories about the African-American community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be featured more prominently in the Post. And because we don't have a great of time here, I'm going to have to leap forward. It would appear that the best opportunity you got to do that was when you became an editor in the style section. How did that happen? Well, uh, I I really quit the post at about in about 1965, 66 because, you know, I had children. It was before the women's movement, and I tried to get a job. I tried to get just a four day a week schedule. Uh, just you know, I said I'll work from seven a.m. to nine p.m. But you know, I had these these little girls, and uh, they said we can't do that, and uh, so. Finally, I, I begged and begged. It was finally, because you tried to work around it in all <laughs> right, kinds of ways. Right, I tried to work it around it. I couldn't. So finally, uh, I went, uh, I said, I, I just can't. So they said, okay, you can do it. I think I did it for about two weeks. <laughs> and they said, you can't. You said, you, you are lowering the morale in the newsroom. <laughs> that there are a lot of uh, uh, men who want to write the great American novel. And if you, you know, if we let you work part time. Yeah, and I think I got pregnant the third time, so I'd have an excuse to quit. <laughs> so that was that. You went back. Under what conditions? Uh, well, I was finally, by then it was 1972, the women's movement was, I was finally able to negotiate a four-day week. Mm -hmm. And uh, that helped me as an editor. But what I wanted to do was to bring more black culture to the larger American public. I just, I just felt that that was a, a very, very little uh, known among the larger white population. And so I was, I, there was a great editor uh, back there named Tom Kendrick. We got along, and he really let me do a lot. Uh, so I was able to hire reporters. You know, we went to the Washington Star and hired, hired a great reporter named Jackie Trescott, <laughs> and she was, she was just wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and um, we were able to, um, you know, Jackie really. Here? Jackie Trescott here? Stand up, please. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Jackie also helped me with the book. She did some great reporting on the yeah, book. Yeah, I thought so. I saw her hand raised up there. Up there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, you know, after a while, you know how. In America, you know, you can have a liberal period and then you pendulum swings and there's a conservative <laughs> period. So, No, we uh, haven't noticed, actually. 
<laughs> Excuse me for being so obvious. Um, but um, so we, we, um, we were just doing a lot of good stuff. And uh, I mean, I think Jackie must have written 15 articles on roots and, and uh, uh, you know, she, she was, they were able to do some of the stories they cared about. And so uh, one of the, after a while, one day, and I, I'm not going to name the editor, too, there are too many people. He said, I thought the style section was the Afro-American. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, that's not a good sign. Something's <laughs> going to be changing soon. So uh, I was able to uh, segue into writing a column. Not, not a straight segue, but, you know. But that was a period during which the African-American community found itself reflected more in the pages of the Washington Post than at any time previously and remembered all of those writers that you hired. A couple of them were there before. And you said you kind of knew it was coming to an end. What did coming to an end mean? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, the style section yes. and needing to... It, it, when I... When, when, You know, when they thought uh, there were too many, many black stories in style. I mean, that's kind of what the editor uh, meant when he said he thought it was the Afro. So, and that, I think that meant we were entering a conservative era. And, uh, you know, uh, I the think... The newspaper was going to reflect that. Right. N newspapers are, you know, I think, you know, we're fortunate to have people who are well-trained. Um, this is obviously talking about the legacy media. It's a new day today. But uh, uh, the Post had people who were well-trained, uh, people who were, uh, after uh, my Watergate time, people who wanted to come and work with Bradley. And so you had, you know, people with fierce ambitions. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, an exciting time. But by the 80s, when the Reagan era began, Uh, that's when there, there was there was a time for an, something new, and uh, so I was just I was happy to be. I knew I had to leave style because you know I couldn't do stories. I was doing stories about the source of Perrier water, <laughs> you know, just because I was, uh, you know, and that I mean anybody can do that. So I and I was in Europe, so I you know they'd say or go to to Lyon and you know, write about the food. And I was like, no, I've, I've got to do something more. And so I was really fortunate when the column idea came. Uh, How did the column idea come? Well, I went to Bradley and I said, uh, I, I'd like to have a job uh, maybe uh, running um, one of the magazines, like there's a, a magazine called Potomac. And I knew that was audacious. You know, the chances of me getting it were not that high. But I sent him a, a note, and I never heard from him. So finally, I kind of nervously walked all the way down to the north wall and said, you know, uh, I, I sent you a, a message, and I didn't hear from you. He said, I, I don't know. I must have lost it. I don't know what happened to it. And he said, what did it say? And I told him. And uh, he said, uh, well, we're not going to be changing that magazine now. I'm not going to tell you exactly how he said it because you won't read the book. But, uh, but, but <laughs> a said, lot of people in this room are quite familiar with how he spoke. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Right. I'm not going there. Uh, not today. But at um, any rate, he said, why don't you uh, go, go, to, go to back to style, you know, clean up your desk, you know. He said, then go to Metro, start writing some features. And then when the two, uh, the, at the time, the Metro editors were Bob Woodward uh, and the other one was Herb Denton, who was the first African-American city editor. He said, when they say it's okay to start a column, you can start a column. And um, so after a few months of writing stories, uh, you know, about my community, about uh, just trying to bring some knowledge of the, the, the depth and the variety of people and activities in black communities, trying to bring that to the um, newspaper, um, you know, they said, okay, you can do it. But after a while, I started writing opinion columns. Uh, you know, as Woodward would say, he'd say, well, you, you know, write the whole story, but then give your opinion at the bottom. 
And uh, so I started out doing that. But I kind of segued into some areas that the editors weren't that happy with. <laughs> and so they would say, sometimes they say, you don't write about anything but race. And I was like, well, what's wrong with that? You know, but that wasn't, it also wasn't true because so often it was about people doing different things, not, it wasn't about race, it's just that the people were, you know, uh, people of color or, or uh, not people they were seeing all the time. How important was that to you to be able to, in a way, find your own voice mm -hmm. by expressing your own opinions in the column? It was really important and uh, I got a lot of my ideas from the community. I did not just sit there and think them up, you know. I really, it really was important to, uh, you know, go out and talk to people and see what was on their mind and try to get trends. And, uh, you know, I got so many great stories that way. Uh, and I write about a lot of those stories. But it wasn't always easy. Uh, I mean, I could write what I wanted because I didn't have to have an editor's approval. But it didn't mean the editor always liked it. And sometimes I would write a story, and once it made it through the desk, I would get out of there. I would just leave because <laughs> I knew it was going to be, you know, oh, there she goes again. <laughs> But uh, I, was, I was grateful that uh, I was able to to stay that long. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but I, I really am grateful. And you always had that commitment to broadening the base mm -hmm. of African-American reporters. And in the late 1970s, there arose the organization called the National Association of Black Journalists, an organization of which ultimately you became president. Tell us about that and your involvement in it. Yeah, uh, my first involvement Uh, in working with uh, trying to bring more diversity into the media was with an organization called the uh, Institute for Journalism Education. And that was uh, the leader of that was a guy named uh, Robert Maynard. Also worked with the Post at one point. Right. He worked at the Post and he's the one who brought me into that into that work. Uh, what happened after that was uh, and we did a lot. We trained uh, with the help of, of um, so many foundations and allies, we, we trained uh, over the years uh, more about over a thousand people, uh, mainly uh, people of color and women, to come into the media, starting at small daily newspapers. And we had what we called a summer program for minority journalists. Then we added an editing program Uh, and we then we added a management program. So that was that was one uh, very important piece. But I think I, I felt the need to be with a more activist organization because we were, you know, we were training. Uh, and I knew that the National Association of Black Journalists uh, would be a place where I could could be more activist. And uh, one of the reasons I did that, I had taken a year off from the post and gone to the uh, what was called then the Gannett Media Studies Center in New York. And I wanted to write a book about racial diversity and the importance of racial diversity in the media. Uh, there just was there was so little interest in it. You know, they'd bring all the, the, the big guys, you know, the president of Associated Press and all of that. And I would start talking about diversity in the media and It was as if I had brought a skunk into a black tie party. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I've got to do something that's more activist. And so I was grateful to be elected president of the National Association of Black Journalists. And that was in the early 1990s, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. 1993 to 1995. You mentioned earlier, you used the term legacy media. As you look back on it, from the period of 1961, to now, where do you see the African-American presence in legacy media? Is it improved? Is it a kind of back and forth proposition? Today we're up, tomorrow we're down. Where are we now? Um, my observation is that uh, in terms of legacy media, we are, we are down. Uh, I think uh, in terms of television, there is more of a black presence. But this year, for example, the American Society of News Editors uh, 
uh, really was unable to uh, get a an accurate count of the of the percentage of black journalists uh, in legacy in, in newspapers today, uh, because you know there was not a consistent response from newspapers, and uh, there aren't many newspapers that are really hiring. So I think that presence is is diminished, uh, and you know that's that's very sad because it's certainly a time now when when it's very important that that we have you know more presence. The name of the book is Trailblazer. Did you feel a particular weight on your shoulders from being a trailblazer? Did you feel that because you are a trailblazer, you had a certain obligation that you had and still have? to carry forward? You know, I did not name my book. My, da- <laughs> my daughter Leah named my book. I don't think I would have called myself, I mean, it sounds kind of pompous. Uh, I don't think I would have called myself that. And I, I wasn't thinking about that. You know, I really, really wasn't. Um, I was just thinking about how do you keep this moving? You know, so after after the column, you know, how do you bring more young people into the media? Because I guess I've always known how important diversity and inclusion are, and um, I wanted I wanted to be a part of it. And I, you know, I've just felt it was worth uh, fighting for. And um, well, because you're still doing it, tell us a little bit about your post Washington Post life. Okay, well. Uh, The last thing I did at the Washington Post was to start a program called the Young Journalist Development Program, where we were we sent journalists out into high schools. And so when we had people like, you know, David Broder going out to Whitson High School on his lunch hour to help high school kids, uh, you know, it was a it was a real success at the Post. I was I was surprised at the response uh, and very gratified by it. And. After a while, I thought, well, maybe this could be a national program. So uh, I was able to, you know, hire somebody who was really a fine reporter. Thalia Knight became the uh, director of that program. And I went over to GW and started a program called Prime Movers Media, uh, you know, raising money from various uh, foundations, the Knight Foundation, other foundations. And once again, we sent journalists into high schools in D.C., and uh, in, even into some of the surrounding areas. But what happened in 1997, I learned that not a single news, a single high school in Washington had printed a newspaper. And um, that, was, that was just astonishing. And if I'm co- incorrect on that, then uh, I stand corrected. But my, uh, my information was that uh, they're not, had not, you know, not Wilson, not, you know, any of these schools had printed a newspaper. So at any rate, the Post was, was ready to step forward and to help um, make that happen. And so uh, if the Post would do it, I thought, well, maybe other uh, entities, news entities. So we, we, we partnered with WJLA Channel 7. Uh, we partnered with, um, let's see, what are some of the other... other uh, Entities, but we we partnered with uh, sent journalists into high schools, and then we were able to expand that program to Philadelphia, um, again, uh, in part, you know, with with money from the Knight Foundation. Uh, but at this point, uh, I think I finally gave up on this becoming a national program, and uh, uh, decided maybe it's time to tell the story. I am getting to my last couple of questions. So if there are those of you who have questions, we have microphones in the center aisle and on this side of the room. If you have a question now, would be a good time to start lining up in front of the microphone. We only ask that you try to keep your questions as brief as possible. Um, But you can start lining up before the microphones right now. Any regrets? Any regrets? Not really. No, no. Uh, you know, it's funny. I saw I saw Judy out there, uh, Judy Martin, uh, w- when I was trying to uh, make a difference at, at Georgetown Day School, where the kids were going, younger kids were going to school. I was going to run, wanted to run for the board, 
And uh, she was like, your approach is all wrong. You've got to do it differently. And But I did find, we both finally ended up on the board. But uh, in terms of um, being any regrets, you know, I mean, one would wish to be successful in everything. Uh, you know, I, I really had hoped that the uh, Prime Movers Media Program might have become a national program, just because I know how much journalists really enjoy interacting with young people. And, you know, journalists, we kind of live in a bubble because we move so fast. We're going from one story to the other. And um, we, we don't, uh, you know, we have friends to whom we have, with whom we have great relationships. But, um, you know, we don't, we don't get to really know young people and, and to, to help them, um, you know, with their newspaper. And uh, I remember Milton Coleman was, was another person who was very helpful to me in getting that program started. And uh, he would go out to a high school and the kids would say, you know, he'd say, well, who, who writes the sports? And they said, well, the players write about the sports. <laughs> and he was like, you can't do that, you know. <laughs> so, you, you know, we were explaining really the basics of, of of things. And so, you know, I had hoped that would become a national program. But I think one of the things that happened, of course, was that we've had such upheaval in the in the media, uh, uh, you know, since what, 2008, or even before that. And right now, uh, Jackie calls it, uh, you know, topsy turvy, period, the 21st century journalism, we're still, we're still defining it. So um, I really, I really have no regrets. I don't want to give away everything in the book, but <laughs> Thank even you. though there are, <laughs> even though there is no regrets, there's at least one slight disappointment, and that was in your relationship with Ernest Withers, the great civil rights photographer. Tell us about that. Well, Ernest Withers was a photographer in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, he was a man who knew how to negotiate the South. So when the Post in 1962 uh, sent me to, uh, as one of, they had a team of reporters covering the integration of the University of Mississippi. And uh, I was sent, once James Meredith finally got into the school, uh, an act which really caused anarchy uh, in, in uh, Oxford, Mississippi, and it was quite something. When the Post sent me down to go and see what the black community was really, what were they thinking? Um, so I uh, called Ernest Withers, and he was going to be my, my you know, secret weapon to get me in and out of Mississippi alive, because Mississippi is, is, uh, is a, a lynching state. Mississippi is, is really, uh, um, I just knew I, the potential for being dead meat. Uh, was there. and so, so I called Ernest Withers. Uh, he had also taken me to Little Rock uh, for Central High School when I was working in Memphis before I started at the Post. So um, he, he, was a, he was a guy who could get, get you in and out. He would do whatever it took. And on our way from Memphis to Oxford, Mississippi, we were stopped by... Um, some guys in a, a pickup truck with uh, gun racks on the top of the, the truck. So, uh, and they just stopped us, you know, they weren't police or anything, you know, but they stopped us. And so uh, Withers, uh, they came over and, and Withers got out of the car and he said, you know, where are you niggas going? Excuse me for using the N word, but you know, that's what, that's the way they talk. So, um, so, with us, said, we're, we're going to, um, oh, what do you say? We're going to Jackson to see my uncle. And, um, and, and he knew an, an alternate route to get there. And uh, I mean, Mississippi was, was so awful that there were no hotels for black people, so I stayed in a funeral home. Um, there, there were, uh, you know, no places to eat. But what I found was a community that was so... Uh, happy and so thrilled that this one man, James Meredith, had the audacity to integrate, you know, this bastion of white supremacy that uh, they were just thrilled. They just couldn't. They were just ready for the next fight. And, uh, and Withers was with me. He took me everywhere I needed to go. 
He even took me to that funeral home. So um, many years later, uh, when I learned that Withers uh, had... Who took some of the most iconic pictures, photos of the civil rights movement? He took some of wonderful, wonderful photographs. And, uh, but that he had also been an FBI informant. Uh, that, was, that was just devastating to me. Uh, I had, uh, I, I hope it was after I worked with him. <laughs> that was the last time in 1962. But uh, who knows? Uh, it's, it's just a flawed, a flawed person. Yeah. Maybe it's time for you to request your FBI folder. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, you mentioned Jackie saying earlier how the media today has become. One element of that is because we now exist in a digital environment. And there is so a proliferation of news, pseudo news media, mm-hmm. but there also there also is a proliferation of of black writers in the digital environment themselves as news reporters, analysts, and the like. Mm-hmm. How do you view that environment? Well, I think there are some positives about that. Uh, I think uh, when you look at uh, how being on the ground and uh, a response to something that came out, I, uh, I believe it was on black Twitter, but if not, it was, it was, it, it, it went viral was the whole phrase such as black lives matter. You know, that, that is something that um, was, was, I, I think really significant in America. Uh, it may sound insignificant, but, you know, it, it really it really made a statement about the condition of, of, of African Americans. Even today, you know, when we look at like things like the prison industrial complex, you know, that still exists. Um, and so I think the fact that um, you can get that kind of really relevant uh, um, uh, exchange uh, from from black people to the and, and the whole country reacted. I mean, some people said, well, white lives matter too. Um, but it just, it, it shows you something about the country in a different way. Uh, I am definitely not an expert at all on social media, and I can't say that I, I look at it a lot. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I can give you a, a very profound answer on that. How have you found the responses to your book so far? Uh, I've been gratified. I have been really gratified. You know, you don't know when you spend all those years at the computer and you, you don't know how it's going to turn out. And But the fact that, that people have, uh, uh, I think it made the Washington, D.C. bestseller list or something. <laughs> One of the top ten or something like that. Uh, so I I'm guess really, most importantly... How did your daughters like it? Uh, yeah, my daughters, I think my daughters in general like it. It's very difficult to write about, you know, a marriage that ended and try not to, not to uh, uh, be, uh, you know, harmful, hurtful, but to tell enough to at least explain who you are. Uh, and so they had a, a lot of input on that family chapter. Boy, they were taking things out. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They were so opinionated from a very young age because you decided to raise them right. in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. That's right. And they had a lot of opinions about that. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, I think they were they were uh, kind of uh, dealing with a lot of race, class, wealth issues. I don't think that we were always uh, as uh, thoughtful as we might have been. Uh, we were just trying to find a better school for them uh, than the neighborhood school, which had 35 kids in a class. So, um, and I didn't want them to go to, you know, some school where there'd be so there'd be so few African Americans, and and they'd be, you know, I didn't, you know, I just didn't want people feeling their hair, and you know, just, you know, just they didn't. I didn't want them to be an oddity. So uh, I, we Georgetown Day School we thought was you know had a, a you know most diverse school, and so they but they were there were some difficult issues that they were 
that they were dealing with. As I said, not just only the race and class and the wealth issues, uh, but uh, uh, the fact that the neighborhood issues. The neighborhood. The neighborhood was very, uh, very much you know economically challenging. and challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, challenging. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, they they survived and uh, <laughs> they're they're all doing well and so are the grandchildren. They survived enough to name the book. As a, matter, I know. As, as a matter of fact, yeah. What's next for Dorothy Butler Gilliam? You know, I don't know. I really don't know. I I haven't dreamt I haven't dreamt it up yet. Uh, right now, I want to keep you know focusing on. Uh, the book, but I, I think it's kind of providential in a sense that the book came out right now uh, when, you know, the media is being kind of attacked at the highest levels of government and uh, at a time when, uh, the, you know, we who work in the media, you know how we know it's imperfect, but we know how essential it is, you know, to the democracy. And so, you know, when you, when I, hear those kind of attacks uh, you know the enemy of the people and the uh, just there's just it's there's just been so many issues and I don't want to get into a you know, great political exchange but I think that um, it's it's important for people to to uh, remember uh, and to know how how crucial media is and what a great responsibility leg- legacy media still has uh, to to really uh, be the truth tellers. And that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about uh, the importance of diversity in the media, because you can't have a true picture uh, if you don't have all voices, or all communities represented. And that's where that brings greater understanding, that, that, that brings uh, a greater uh, a knowledge uh, of, to the public. Uh, because I still remember after the, the riots in the 60s, I call them the rebellions. But after that, you know, the Kerner Commission uh, really blamed the media in part uh, for the riots because it, it said, uh, you know, uh, only about 5% of the employees are, are uh, uh, black. And that means you're really trying to see America through white eyes. And you can't you can't know another's truth. You have to go to that community, you know. So we are at a place now where, where we talk about diversity and inclusion, and that means including uh, all representatives, you know, the, the gay community, the, uh, you know, women and, and people of all races. And, you know, that's, that's how we get a really strong America. Well, you know, for those of us who came along in the media in the late 60s and the early 1970s trying to find a way ahead, I think one of the reasons the name of the book is appropriate is because we always looked to you. We always knew that Dorothy Gilliam was at the Washington Post and we could read her on a regular basis. And that, in many respects, became our frame of reference, gave us the knowledge that we, too, could forge ahead. So it was with no surprise that when you became president of the National Association of Black Journalists, you got so much support from so many of us here because you were always that beacon of light for the rest of us. And now, as always, just as we're running out of time, we get people at the microphones. You, sir, are first. Thank you so much. Mr. Gilliam, thank you so much for such an engaging discussion. Um, I'm a history teacher in a high school. And I find that a lot of my students are very sheltered in their lives and they're not, they're not exposed to very much adversity. And it sort of limits them and it makes them unable to be compassionate and to be understanding of other people's difficulties. And I'm curious to know how your challenges in your life, how you, fe- how you feel they have impacted your sense of empathy and compassion. Um, yeah, I, I think my challenges have really, really affected my sense of empathy and compassion. Uh, I think that um, uh, being part of the joy of being a reporter is the fact that you can interact with people, it, and you and you can. You, when I had some control over that as a as a columnist, uh, it, it was important to talk to people who, you know, who had done things, who were doing things that made me know uh, that 
at all levels and all races and all of that, you had people who were uh, about, you know, doing business, who were about uh, making things better, who were about making a better society, uh, you know, who weren't just uh, 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 living a life, but wanting that life to have meaning. And um, so I think when I hear, hear someone speak as you, I, I think it would be so great if you could start, if your children, uh, your students, could start having interactions, even if with other schools. If they are kind of isolated and, and sheltered, um, you know, maybe, maybe they, you should find ways that they can start interacting with some of the kids who live in Southeast and, sure. Uh, you know, and I think somehow just knowing about others' lives, uh, exchanging information about others' lives is so important. And that's, that is one way that uh, kind of gets people uh, out of themselves and into the knowledge that they're, you know, you're really not the only person in the world, as most kids think they are. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would love to, you know, see more of that. I think this is a time that's crucial for, for us to start talking to each other more, uh, to, to really begin to, uh, you know, deepen our understanding because we're in such a polarized situation that um, if we don't uh, make extra efforts, you know, to start to, to broaden that understanding and knowledge, um, you know, we don't, we don't know really what's ahead. Thank you so much. You, sir. It's kind of a tangential question, but I thought you might want to comment on two movies that are very popular that are peripherally relate oh. to what you've been doing and saying, and because you're partially from that area. But uh, The Green Book and uh, If Beale Street Could Talk. And perhaps you care not, wouldn't care to comment on either of those. Have you seen The Green Book? Have you seen If Beale Street Could Talk? I have seen uh, Green Book and... Uh, if Beale Street uh, Talk. I have not seen that one. It's only in one movie theater in Washington. I looked through the list yesterday. I'm, I'm a little startled and perplexed that. Too. Yeah, uh, but I, I I like the Green Book, and uh, you know I you know I love uh, James Baldwin. Um, Beale Street. Yeah. Be, yeah, B e a l e. If Beale Street could talk. If Beale Street, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I've heard their great movies. I mean, I'm sorry, I liked Green, uh, Green Book, and I've heard the other one is a great movie, so it's on my list. Thank you. You, sir. Good evening, everyone. Arthur Jones II, CBS News, Washington Bureau. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your wisdom this evening, Ms. Gilliam, you. and for everything that you've not only done for me, but for everyone in this room and every journalist. You mentioned the attacks on the press, um, enemy of the people is one of the phrases you said. Last fall, the president actually attacked three black female White House correspondents. Um, the 2017 NABJ Journalist of the Year, April Ryan, Yamichi Alcindor of PBS NewsHour, and then CNN's Abby Phillip on the White House South Lawn, he called one of her questions stupid. If that were you today, um, <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with this, but just impart some wisdom on everyone on how you would handle situations such as these. Oh, it's really a, a nightmare situation, you know, when, when you have that level of attack, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and um, you know, and I think we're 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 all concerned. Uh, you know, we're all concerned uh, on a on a deep level about um, about what's next. I think I would do exactly what what April and the other women are, are doing. I would keep moving. I would keep I would keep reporting. I'd keep writing. Mm -hmm. I'd keep uh, I'd keep raising my hand uh, to ask questions, even when. Uh, uh, they were ignored, but it's, it's very painful because I know, I know how painful it is for them, you know, but you have to, you know, and you have to keep fighting even when you're hurting. And I, that's what I, that's what I admire so much about them. I, I think they stand on the shoulders of, you know, people like Ida Wells Barnett, 
uh, you know, women who really uh, stood and, uh, uh, you know, risked their lives uh, to make a difference and to and to let the nation know what was going on. And that's exactly what that what these women were doing. Did anything but, like that ever happen to you? Sorry to cut you off. Uh, I've been called a lot of names, but not by a president. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Thanks very so. much for your Thanks question. For yeah. And she'll hate me for saying this, but there is a television trailblazer in the room. Maureen Bunyan is sitting oh, right there. My Another inspiration to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Dorothy Butler Gilliam. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you, thank you, Dorothy, and, and, um, and thank you, Kojo.